Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin, coming to you from inside the closet of my childhood bedroom. Today's conversation features musician, producer, writer, journalist, and my dad, Ben Sidrin. I've been thinking about doing an episode with my dad like this for a long time, but it's not so obvious. In fact, he's been on the podcast plenty of times. He co-hosted some episodes with me uh, when we were on tour together. We mourned the loss of Tommy LaPuma together a couple of years ago. We processed the election of Donald Trump and the terrorist attacks in Paris in 2015 together. So he's, he's no stranger to this project. But to do a proper sit-down long-form interview like I often do on the podcast, it's a little bit nuanced for us because we've been having lots of conversations for years or maybe just one long conversation. It's not something that has a beginning or an end. It's not something that you can slap an introduction on and call it an interview. I mean, it's just ongoing. So trying to capture a concise interview with him is a little bit like trying to capture a running river in a container. It, it, it just doesn't really work that way. But in thinking about how to frame an interview with my dad, I thought, what better time to do it than on the occasion of his 76th birthday, which is this week. Actually, it was yesterday. So that's basically the box that we, we put the conversation into. What does it feel like to be 76? What did you uh, hope for yourself? What did you expect? Uh, did it live up? How are you different? How is the world different? Etc. That's what kind of informed the conversation. But at the end of the day, it's really just a version of an interview that I do with my dad in which we kind of explore his career and life. And anyway, I think it's a really beautiful conversation. I'm really happy to share it with you today. I have to approach this way I would approach any other episode and assume you, you know, you don't know anything about him. So I'm going to tell you in broad strokes a little bit about his career. He's a musician. He's a singer and a songwriter. He's a jazz piano player. He fell in love with bebop as a young boy, and that's been his kind of guiding light through the whole thing. Uh, he's made 30-some records as a solo artist. He's also produced albums for Diana Ross, Van Morrison, Mose Allison. He even had his own label in the 1990s and early 2000s. He produced albums for lots of people, mostly jazz-related, but not always. His relationship with Steve Miller and the Steve Miller Band is kind of interwoven into the first 30 years of his career, but he's been around for so long that the first 30 years of his career ended 30 years ago. Nonetheless, his association with the Steve Miller Band is something that follows him around, and particularly his contribution to the early records and co-writes with Steve, including the song Space Cowboy, which we talk about in this conversation. He also worked as a journalist. He was devoted to capturing conversations, not unlike these conversations that I'm having, with jazz greats in the 1980s. And he talked to luminaries. He talked to the top of the top, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, Max Roach, on and on and on, uh, over 100 conversations with living legends at the time, many of whom are no longer with us. And some of those conversations really became kind of definitive. The one with Miles in particular is quoted and sourced often. Additionally, at a TV show on VH1, he's written a number of books about music and sociology. He has a PhD from the University of Sussex in England, and his PhD dissertation was published as the book Black Talk in the early 1970s. He also published a memoir and a book, There Was a Fire, Jews, Music, and the American Dream, about eight years ago. That book explored the Jewish contribution to popular music in America, and uh, as you can tell, this is a kind of uh, information that flows freely through my veins and in my mind all the time because I work with him a lot. If you consult his website, bensidron.com, you will find my regular handiwork because I maintain that website. So it's a pretty reliable source. His performance style has evolved over the years into something really unique and unusual. His um, singing style is often compared to a kind of version of rap. The Times of London called him the world's first existentialist jazz rapper. Downbeat Magazine referred to him a few years ago as being the voice of his generation. I think they said something like he could be considered the voice of his generation. There's something in his speaking and singing style that is at once very elevated and also a very plain spoken. He's a kind of public intellectual in many ways, but he works out his ideas often on stage in jazz clubs. So it's highbrow and it's bass level. It's seductive what he does, and it's really unique. Third-story.com is the place to go to sign up, subscribe, see the archive, hang out, get involved, and also while you're there, check out the Spotify playlist that I have curated for this episode, as I often do. 
and some of the videos that I also posted. Patreon.com slash Third Story Podcast is the place you go when you're so motivated and so moved that you want to put some skin in the game and support this project on a financial level. One final note. In honor of my dad's 76th birthday that we're celebrating this week, I wrote a song. It's called Pop. It's actually a song that tells the story of my dad and his father and kind of explores the continuity, memory, desire. It's a very personal, very heartfelt song. I released it yesterday, and uh, there's a video that accompanies it. That's also available for your viewing pleasure on the website third-story.com. Without further ado, here he is, my dad, Ben, 76 years old, birthday conversation. Here we go. This is 24 hours before my 76th birthday, sitting in the house I've lived in for 31 years, waiting. Who's in charge here? What is oh, who's, oh, hi there. Ben Sidron, you're 76 years old. Tomorrow. Well, through the magic of podcasting. <laughs> yesterday. You're, right. you're 76 years old yesterday. <laughs> Not, right. What, what does that sound like when I say those words to you? Yeah, well, uh, clearly it sounds like somebody else. It couldn't be me. As Mose Allison has said, that gray-haired, I think he said geezer. I'm not sure. That gray-haired guy you think you see, that ain't me. That's, and that's how you feel? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. I mean, other times I feel uh, completely uh, copacetic uh, with uh, the uh, package that I'm currently walking around in. Uh -huh. And other times I'm shocked. You know, it reminds me of, uh, I did an interview 30-plus uh, years ago with Gil Evans in a recording studio uh, on Lower Broadway. And he walked into this studio, and actually, now come to think of it, I think at the time he was 73 years old or 74. And he walked in, he looked great, he was wearing jeans and a t-shirt. He sat down, he took out a pipe, he lit it, took a pull, a long exhale, and he said, ah, oh, man, you know, I, oh, I said to him, you look great, man. He said, well, except when I look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And I don't recognize me anymore. So, and I remember at the time thinking, gee, I guess 73 years old. Well, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, what did, what did 75 years old look like to you when you were a younger man? I mean, I'm not even talking about a kid, but I'm just, even in your adult life, what it's 70, to be, to live a life in jazz and be 75 years old, what did that... I think about like, for example, those videos that you produced, those laser discs yeah. that you produced in the early eighties for Blakey and Johnny Griffin and yeah. those cats maybe weren't even 75. Oh, of course then. not. Oh no. No, this is old. There's some oldness involved in uh, the current situation. Yeah. Uh, what did it feel like? What does it feel? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Cause obviously uh, I don't feel any different. I mean, I feel like the same kid trapped inside the same brain that I've uh, felt like for a long time. I'm, I mean, I know I've told you that when I was six years old, I had a specific memory of looking out of these eyes and thinking, oh man, I just gotta be patient and I'll get out of here one day. You know, I wasn't talking about out of my head, I was talking about out of the situation I was in. Which was what? Which was living in Racine, Wisconsin, uh, in a house that was not a happy house, uh, and uh, just thinking that I was in the wrong place. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, you might feel the, the same way and not, not to take it to like a, a dark turn so quickly here. But but, you know, one thing I feel is you although you may be the same, the world is not the same place. Yeah, I have to keep going back. You know, if you read history, if you read anything at all, what one thing that keeps coming up is it's cyclical. I mean, no, we haven't seen anything like this lunatic who's running a rough shot over our lives. Isn't it interesting how nobody wants to say his name? It's like invoking the devil. Uh, he's a unique uh, variation on a very old theme, you know? Uh, he's Nero. He's watching Rome burn. You know what, though? I wasn't even talking about that. Oh, you weren't? No. I, oh. I mean, but, but it's interesting how <laughs> that has just dominated the way we it think has. about things. Yeah. I mean, really, what I think about is, okay, so we're in this room, right? And uh, in your house in, in Madison. And, you know, uh, this is one of several rooms in the house that that's kind of decorated with various artifacts from mm. your life and your journey. Here, for example, on the wall is uh, a two-panel 
drawing that was given to you by Tony Bennett mm. when he came to hear you play in London some years ago. And it's a drawing of you and a saxophone player uh, on the stage at the Pizza Express that was handed to you by Tony Bennett. Here mm. on the wall is a chart that was handed to you by your friend and mentor and hero and uh, mm. cat, cat. Ma Mose Allison, who gave you a chart from a session that you produced for him. And it says, for Ben, thank you for the help and friendship, Mose oh. Allison. Oh, nice. And here on the wall... Oh, yes. My favorite artifact, the album cover of Volume 1, Birdland Stars on Tour, uh, autographed by Phil Woods. And that is the first record I ever bought. Um, I saw that in a little record store in Racine, Wisconsin. I guess I was 12, something like that. And if you look at the cover, you see these guys and they're all wearing matching burgundy blazers and they have their hair slicked back and there's a spotlight above them. And I just thought that these guys look so cool, look so great. I took it home and I fell in love with the music. And one of the guys on their record was Phil Woods. And so many years later, I brought that along to a thing that I was doing with Phil. And I said, Phil, I, I've never asked you to, to autograph anything for me, but this is my favorite artifact. Would you sign it? What do you think would have sounded crazier to you as that 12-year-old boy? That one day you would get to know Phil Woods, be friends with him, work with him, or that you would one day be 76 years old? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think there are probably uh, equivalents there. Are, I had no consciousness of ever having a life that would lead me to meet Phil Woods or Horace Silver and his be. I mean, that never... I mean, literally, uh, growing up in Racine, Wisconsin, in the 50s, I mean, my memories are of walking, goofing around in the park, you know, uh, running down the alleys, uh, lying in a field of milkweeds, looking up at the sky. Uh, there wasn't a lot of memorable stuff. Kids today at age six have got all this education coming at them from all different sides. We were uh, seriously free range kids. They yeah. would throw us out the door at, yeah. in the morning and say, come back for dinner. Yeah. And uh, so the idea of that life leading to anything uh, other than kind of more of the same just never occurred. It was only when I became uh, aware of the hardships of life that I started to discover jazz, really. Mm -hmm. You know, the jazz was a res for, in me, jazz was a response. The music... I took to it as a response to a sense of otherness and isolation. And it, it, I heard something in this music that said they, the people who made the music understood. Jazz was your mode of transportation. It was my mode of transportation. So when I was like 12 or something, I, I, I was very different from all the other kids that I grew up around. They didn't read books by and large, and I was captured by books. They didn't listen to these the records that I did, but most of all, uh, they weren't uh, Jews. And so when they came across a Jew in a Danish community in Wisconsin, I was a bit of an oddity, and I, uh, I took some heat from that. And, you know, it doesn't take much uh, to push somebody over the edge uh, into a suffering. Life in, in a life in jazz. <laughs> well, you know, this is very interesting. There's a, uh, the biography of Artie Shaw that he uh, writes. He talks about... He moved as a young boy, like eight or nine, from, I think, Brooklyn or something, to upstate New York. Yeah. And he similarly felt like an oddity. And he remembers being a kid at, on the playground, and he saw a, a whole line of ants walking along. And he was fascinated because he had never seen ants before growing up in the city. And he called all the other kids over and said, look, look at this. And they just laughed at him. They humiliated him. He said that was the key experience in his entire life. Being laughed at. Let him know he was an outsider. That pushed him over the edge into jazz. So, okay, so I understand that being different already, you know, you were in a kind of a slightly unusual uh, category growing up. And maybe in some ways that, as we would say, fertilized the soil for you to uh, become who you became. Well, yeah. I mean, the idea, see, I was not, and it's kind of, it feels ironic to me that I'm seen in some instances as an academic or uh, whatever. I mean, I've always been fascinated with ideas, but I've always been kind of a ne'er-do-well when it came to school. Mm. I never studied, and I never really uh, thought that uh, 
I was going to be uh, particularly uh, comfortable in schools and was always looking for the easy way out. Yeah. And I I would, for example, always respond to just the little flame of human kindness wherever it came from. That would attract me. If it was from a teacher, more the better yes. than, than I would like that. But I was not attracted by achievement. The idea of achieving never pushed me forward. Was, it, was achievement in general... Um something that people talked about when you were no. in college? Because, I mean, everybody could go to college. When I went to the University of Wisconsin, I was a Wisconsin resident. And if you were a Wisconsin resident, if you had a three-point average, a B average, they had to take you. And tuition was $125. Yeah. And what was achievement? I mean, achievement was showing up with one new shirt and one new pair of pants and, you know, a, a jacket and in my case, a tie, because I wanted to represent, you know. Actually, when I think about it now, I think the tie was just a way to deflect any inquiry into my seriousness. Into your deviancy. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it was, it was so different. I mean, and it, it makes me think, you know, uh, back when I was 21 years old, mm -hmm. and I'd be thinking back on what the 20s might have been like, because yeah. that's kind of what we're talking about. It would have seemed like uh, a world that wasn't even in color. It was black and white. Yeah. There were Model T Fords. And how could you live like that? How could you live without telephones and stuff? You know? So what, there was a sense of technology as being at the heart of uh, innovation, of development, of uh, it, it modernity. Happened, it happened later. It happened so long <laughs> ago. It, it did happen later. In, in the early 60s, it was very much... Uh, like the 40s. Like the 40s and 50s. The big innovation had been little portable record players. There were no tape recorders, for example. Yeah. We had lots of bands and stuff, but we never taped ourselves because there were no cassette recorders or anything. So, that, no, technology kind of happened all at once. It started kind of slowly, you know. It took a long time, for example, uh, you know, high-fidelity stereo records. That was a big deal, and we sold them for a while. But then it started exploding, you know. The cassette tape recorders were a big deal. And that happened in the 60s. You could record late, things. Late 60s, yeah. But no, there was no technology. There was no push for achievement. There was none of that. It really was about trying to figure out what the meaning of life was. It yeah. sounds kind of corny now. But trying to figure out what the purpose was. And so all the education was kind of toward that. We didn't really care much about what our grades were. I mean, if you survived, that was good. Nobody thought about getting A's. I mean, if you got an A... You really were somebody or something. Well, it's interesting, right? Because so many of the stories you hear about academic achievement in the 60s are kind of framed around avoiding going to war. I mean, that, that'll motivate you to stay in school and get a degree, right? There was that. But, you know, I would like to be the antidote to the feeling that that's what it was mostly about. There was a lot of that and there was a lot of pressure. And boy, when they were coming to draft your ass, you paid attention to the issues. No question about that. But the overall feeling of living at that time was one of excitement and uh, a deep engagement with a kind of caring, not just lust, because we were 20 years old, but caring about, uh, boy, this is tough, you know, uh, history, caring about people in, in terms of the betterment of their experience, caring. Do you think that's true, or are we framing it that way now? Are we remembering it that way now? Well, I mean, the reason we were so passionate about going to these history courses that were taught by these radical historians is because they would frame these history classes in terms of making a better life for the people rather yes. than saying this war was fought at this right. time and stuff. There, the people were always at the center of it, and the idea was that the world generally was getting better and that we were part of that right i mean that's kind of what we thought and that's why there was so much energy against the war i mean it was just right there in front of you that was the uh that was the enemy the story about the 60s always comes back to the war because i think in a way the war colored over a lot of those factions so many people were brought together by their common understanding that they they didn't believe in this war well look the war was like uh a constant distraction that was going on. I wouldn't say that me... You did you wake up every morning and think about Vietnam? No. No, it was a constant distraction out there, just like you can't turn on the news today because of the constant distraction. It was a constant, constant distraction out there. But that's not who we were, and that's not what motivated us, you know, really. we look. That's why, that is why I think you are 
generally arguing that the Vietnam War should not be the defining Absolutely. factor when we talk about what happened in the 60s. Absolutely not. And people can't get away from that. It's just so seductive. And I think because it's simple. It's a simplified way of looking at what the experience of the 60s was. was. It wasn't just the war. The war was a convenient shirt to put on. Uh, there are lots of shirts you could have put on. Uh, but there was this idea of opening up the box, letting some air into the room, yeah. you know, uh, and, and jazz and music was it. That was it. Sitting in a room with people, listening to music, smoking a joint was it. That's, that was the sacred experience. And I don't mean any, you know, uh, touchy feely sacred experience what i mean is that would just stop you cold yes. and you would reevaluate your life in terms of the sounds that yeah. came out of this little klh record player yes. because those sounds implied a whole other world and and i think that when you and you know that's what my dissertation was written on eventually the difference between being formed by and taking information in orally as opposed to visually you know today every everything is visual i mean the sound quality doesn't matter that much the melody doesn't matter that much it's just sound is just part of this landscape of of input that we get all day long but back then sound was magical sound was very important mm -hmm. i think sound was a direct connection to the world we've become much more focused on visual input well, not just visual, but virtual. I mean, uh, it, it passed through visual kind of, but yes, visual. I mean, it, a computer screen is visual. It, it's all visual. Uh, music, uh, see, music is a very special case of a special case. Sound is a special case of input. It affects people emotionally. It affects them at a ground level. Uh -huh. It's just uh, the first input a, 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 baby has. A, a baby has before they're born is the sound of the mother's blood pulsing, mm -hmm. the rhythm of, of, of circulation. That's, mm -hmm. that's like pretty basic. And so sound is, is very powerful. And, and today you have so many virtual inputs that no wonder people are, are confused and dazed <laughs> and not connected to the experience of being here. I can't imagine life without bebop mm -hmm. to me be bebop being my favorite idiom mm -hmm. and i'm sure that people felt the sw same way about swing or any other kind something about that music that that music in the 20th century mm -hmm. defined what life felt like what it was mm -hmm. and you just wanted to get as close to that fire as you could and yeah. if you're sitting around the fire and people are talking a language you want to learn the language yes. and that's why people you know eventually learned to play they wanted to be part of that Yes. So you're describing this this period in which and, you know, you talk about the radical historians who uh, framed the world in a, in a certain narrative. But you're really talking about one or two people. You came into contact with a teacher at the University of Wisconsin at the same time that you heard some there music. Were, there were very few of us. Let's be honest. Yeah. In the city of Madison, Wisconsin, at the time where I was, where there might have been one hundred and fifty thousand people. Uh that could have been 20 of us or 50, but it was not a large cohort that no, was into this music. No, well, not only that was into this music, but that were also intellectuals. I mean, the thing that I always sort of yeah. grew up understanding was that there was a, a kind of person who understood, appreciated, even could play credibly, could play bebop, also could dedicate their life to ideas, to a search for meaning, be an intellectual. They were not mutually exclusive. They were supportive of one another. And these were your people. And, and these, yes. And, and to an extent, what you have done and the uniqueness of what you invented over the years seems almost like an inevitability if you look at it through that lens. But really, it's pretty unusual. I stayed the course. I stayed the course. I absolutely stayed the course. I know that. It's like I fell in love with something. Let's not try to define it. I fell in love with something uh, when I was 19 or 20 years old. And it became obvious to me that that was the assignment. Yeah. And uh, all the, the little decisions that were made along the way were based on staying that course. And I, so I, when you say, what does it feel like to be 76? In some ways, it feels just like being 20 years old because I'm still on that path. And another... Uh, instances it feels quite different yeah right 
Well, over the years, people have suggested that you weren't interested in money and that's why you made certain decisions that you made or that you weren't interested in commercial success. And that's why you made certain decisions that you made. You always said, well, I didn't know how to do it any other way. And I always said, well, that's a lie. But in a way, I guess I see that it's not a lie. It's not a lie. It's not a lie. No, I gave up my best shot. <laughs> you know, it's like Phil Wood said, you know, times are tough. We got to do it the American way. We expand. Yeah. We'll have a big band. Well, that's a jazz musician's approach. How does a jazz musician make a million dollars? He starts with $2 million. Right. I have never been gifted at making money. What I've been gifted at is kind of parsing my times. Yeah. You know, that's why I say that everything... Uh, people say, oh, gee, you, you've written books and you play music and you produce records. You know, who will the real Ben sit yeah. and stand up? And to me, they're all the same. It's all the same gesture to me. It's a kind of parsing of the times. Well, you used to refer to it as journalism. You used yeah. to say that you thought essentially what you're doing was a form of journalism. Yeah. What, did, what do you mean? What does that mean? Just trying to, uh, using various grammars, describe what it f feels like on the planet while I'm here. And I've been fortunate to have come through very interesting situations, you know, times, uh, you know, like Paris in 1968, just not on purpose, just coming out of the metro and there it was. I mean, it's kind of a metaphor for uh, a, a dozen, two dozen things that I kind of walked through, whether it was the Capitol Records building in 1972 or whatever it was. And then, you know, the, the work that I've done, even if it's writing a song that's not about Capitol Records in 1962, but somehow the feeling of what I do or the details are entangled with the experience of the times to the extent that I think of it as just trying to report on what it felt like. What does it feel like? Did you have a sense at some early stage in your life that you were living through interesting times, that this was a unique time to be alive and into oh boy, what you were yes. into? Oh, boy, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons why getting out of her scene was so important to me. I oh, you felt, knew it that early? Oh, yeah. You I felt it that early? In high school. Not at six years old. In high school, I felt definitely, like when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, that I just had to wait to, uh, till I was able to leave town, uh, that th these were fantastic times. There was a lot going on, and uh, it was just sitting out there. I mean, that's what listening to Horace Silver meant to me. It's exactly what it meant to me. It meant there's something out there. There's something out there, and they're waiting for you. These are your people. You, you described it to me once as feeling like you're on one side of a wall and there's people on the other side of it speaking, and you have to figure out how to speak that language through the muffled sound of hearing them through over a wall yeah and it's part and parcel of uh, the thing that i say about you can spend eight hours a day blowing through a copper tube and at the end of 20 years the saxophone hasn't changed but you've been totally transformed right learning to understand jazz let alone play jazz will transform you it's not just about the music it yeah. just always knocks me out when people talk about jazz as specifically about learning to play the music that's like you know saying uh you know the 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 ocean is about fish you know it, it's not it doesn't begin to scratch the surface of what the jazz experience is well so what is the jazz experience in in your mind then well you know that's a that's a great question because for me jazz for years represented the american experience and who america was and it also kind of in a way substituted for the Jewish experience because I always was told that the Jewish experience was about the good and about making the world a better place. And in my early years when I couldn't see it in the Jewish experience, I saw it in the jazz experience. Today it's quite different. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why people of my generation have so much difficulty with players of this generation. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like literature. Let, let's sidestep jazz for a minute. Uh, the way literature used to be taught in the 60s, the way they used to teach books, was in terms of the theme of the book or the underlying philosophy. Then came deconstruction. Then came uh, Foucault and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And it wasn't about the book anymore. It was about how one shaves off the levels of how one talks about the book. Mm -hmm. And so it's always <laughs> self-referential. Mm -hmm. well, self-referential. It becomes increasingly self-referential. Right. And jazz kind of has gone through the same process mm -hmm. where it used to be about 
moving a room. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that was the goal. You know, Art Blakey, people mm -hmm. come to wash away the dust of everyday life. They yeah. don't come to get educated. So uh, making a room jump and shout, that mm -hmm. was the goal. Well, today that doesn't seem to be the case. Not that it's supposed to be or should be the case. It's just not the case. Mm -hmm. And this comes to its apogee in the idea of, well, we don't have to swing anymore. It's mm -hmm. not so important to understand what the blues is about because the blues is just a form. Well, the blues isn't a form. The blues is the match that lit the fire, man. Charlie Parker wasn't just about the notes. He was about the blues. You know, I had a conversation with a young man recently. I think I told you this, a young jazz musician who said to me, you know, I'm tired of all of this talk about Charlie Parker. What does Charlie Parker have to say to me? Yeah, well, there you are. And you can't argue it that he's telling you his life. Yeah. But you don't have to. Uh, you know, now we're in the world of false equivalencies. Uh -huh. Now we're in the uh -huh. world of false equivalencies. Uh -huh. At its extreme, <laughs> it's my ignorance is just as good as your education. Yeah. And in its daily manifestation, it's what has Charlie Parker got to say to me? And I refer you to the Passover Seder, uh -huh. where the ignorant child says, but what does the slavery have to do, do with me? me? Yes. And uh, the answer is, remember, you too yes. were a slave in Egypt. <laughs> I see. <laughs> that kind of <laughs> tells you how I feel. I feel, I know, I feel you, man. I feel you. And when you quote Art Blakey, people don't come to the club to get educated, they come to wash away the dust of everyday life. I mean, these are words that we live by, that I grew up living by also. These are words that are as if they were codified in the Passover Haggadah, only they were words that were spoken directly from his mouth to you. Yeah. You went not only into the music, but into the lives of these people. Yeah. And I mean, I'm feeling it right now as I go over all of your interviews that you have that you did in the 80s talking to people, but you went and you talked to these folks and you got a sense of their lives. How did that, what did that mean to you? How did that change how you saw the, the experience? Yeah, I mean, I've said this before. I So I survived graduate school and I got this PhD and I was never intending to do that. And I think I kind of believed that there would be something transformational in the experience of getting a PhD. Just sort of like I say, there's something transformational about sitting at a piano for 20 years. Uh, and there wasn't. And, and what it felt like after graduating with that degree and also my inability to get a job teaching at that point was I got to change directions. And that is, I have to live the life I sing about in my song. I've been singing a particular song for these last few years. I got to go out there and live it. And the way it felt to me was, I said, I want to become the information. I don't want to keep studying the information. I don't want to keep having an opinion, enough of opinions, enough of my opinion, anybody else's opinion. I want to go out there and feel what it feels like. What does it feel like to get paid at the end of the night? What does it feel like, you know, I'm not going to ever be... Uh, a great piano player, but I, I have something I can do. I have something I can contribute. And so I dove head first into the life, into the life. It was for me as big a decision as I probably ever made without ever making a decision. Mm -hmm. I just did it. And so talking to Freddie Hubbard or Art Blakey or any of the cats was part of me trying to understand where I was. One of the things that I'm becoming very aware of now at 76 is how much all this work I've done has been about trying to discover myself, mm -hmm. trying to discover who I am and what does this really mean to me and subsequently what does it mean, period. Mm -hmm. that's, what it's, that's what it was about. I went to these guys as a searcher, looking, not knowing what I was looking for. Hello, I'm a searcher. That's like the idea of, you know, my idea of memory. Memory is very important, but not memory of anything in particular. Just remember. Just remember that time passes, that you are one of the tribe, mm -hmm. that this has happened before in different forms. That's well, memory. You describe a certain kind of skepticism towards the academic world. Oh, yes. Which... It occurs to me in hearing you talk today, maybe the result of not feeling particularly transformed or changed when they gave you that PhD and realizing that if you were still the same schmuck who, you know, you had been 20 minutes earlier, only now you had a PhD, maybe everybody was the same person pre and post PhD, that maybe it's all a little bit of an act. 
Well, it is, and it's all devolved into the same act. I mean, the the act that's going on at top universities today is pretty much the same act that's going on at corporations today. There's no difference. There used to be this, quote, ivory tower approach, but now the corporations own the universities, and the the successful professors are those who are funded by corporations, and so it's, it's the same act. So if you're going to feel like that, yeah. you might as well go out and hang out with some jazz musicians if you're going to feel that way anyway and find out what they've got to tell you. If you want to learn something, that's what you have had to do now i don't know if that's the case you know i think see this is like really uh unfair uh reduction to absurdity but i don't know if you can tell a joke without singing the blues i think the blues is part of what makes life funny and i think part of what jazz was about was as johnny griffin said music jazz is music made by and for people who have chosen to feel good in spite of conditions man in spite of conditions there's an element of humor not just jazz humor jazz jokes you know how does a jazz musician make a million bucks he starts with two but there's humor in the music the way the grammar is unfolded and the way the story is told it's it can be funny i mean how many times have you gone and heard somebody playing cracked up just mm -hmm. listening to him just it's mm -hmm. funny that's what I'm talking about. And you got to be relatively informed to get that humor. That's not for everybody. You've got to be informed to get it. Oh, I hear what you're saying. And, and, and to, to tell it, too, to speak it. It's, it's an amazing thing because it's a kind of gift or skill. It's not about intelligence that gets you a four-point Great. Uh, no, or a mortgage, or, or a keep mortgage. a marriage, no, or not even be all. able to no, find no, your car in the parking lot. That's <laughs> something else, unfortunately. That's exactly right. But it's something deeply, deeply human. And it's simply, uh, something that speaks to what we were talking about, which is meaning. That The, the whole underpinning of, of what we're about here, really, is the search for meaning. And I still believe that. I believe that no matter what shape the society is in or the culture is in the real motivation is meaning and the real problems are people trying to escape the the learning process and trying to get a, a cheap way out of uh, feeling what meaning is whether they're wasting their time on video games or whatever but so are you still searching for meaning boy that's a very good question and that throws me back to my pal phil woods who said as you get older and i'm feeling it now he was about my age when he said this to me i, I asked him What's it like to be able to play anything you can hear? And he said, playing's no problem. Playing's never been a problem. He said, wanting to play is the problem. Getting up in the morning and remembering and being in touch, what it felt like the time you played a whole note and it sounded good. And, and so you have to, you have to, like, like, like we said, you can't affect what happens to you. You can only affect how you respond to that. You can't affect how you wake up in the morning. You know, you wake up how you wake up. But you have to, in spite of conditions, pick yourself up and do something that moves you just a little further down the road you've been on. Yes. And I think the, in the end, the thing that maybe will make me feel good about the journey was that I stuck to it. I maintained it. I saw something that appeared to be a truth and I followed it uh, like a, a light very far away. And sometimes it seemed to get closer and sometimes it seemed to get even further away. Yes. But I kept my eye on it. But this is what I was referring to earlier at the beginning of our conversation when I said it's not the same world that it was. Yes, the, the politics have changed. Yes, he who shall not be named is, is uh, you know, feeding us with a, a steady diet of insecurity and uncertainty and fear and anger and panic. Yes. But what I'm talking about is to have the conditions around you shift so that you're no longer upset that you didn't get the gig, but you're more concerned that there are no gigs left. You know what I mean? <laughs> that the conditions, that, 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 that the context has shifted and you're still here. Yes. And context is everything. Nothing has meaning except for its context. That, that, that's the irony of what we're talking about. Things unto themselves have no meaning. You by yourself has, has no purpose. You in relationship to other people has purpose. We are all in context all the time. Everything is in context. This is what memory is about. Mm -hmm. Memory is context. Yeah. And so meaning comes out of the world. You can't just sort of decide that X means Y and say, well, that's the truth. Although it's being done all the time now. 
so yes, it's shifted and the world is different. And everything I thought was going to be true forever was not true forever. I think that's probably the universal lesson. I think that's one of the things you learn. Well, and that maybe keeps you searching for meaning because the context keeps shifting. Well, that's part of the search. Yeah, absolutely. The context keeps shifting. And, and so again, it throws you back into yourself. Yes. The, 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 the fact is, uh, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. And you took your problems with you. And so ultimately, the context is you in an arbitrary, capricious universe looking for inner resolve and purpose to uh, wake up that day and say, you know what? I can't affect it, but I can affect how I respond to it. I'm going to go play piano or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go pat somebody on the back or I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to affect my situation in some positive way. And, and I don't uh, expect any reward down the line. That's the other thing. Well, that's what I want to ask you about. Not a reward, uh, not, not a financial reward or a, or a statue or something, but, you know, your mantra has always been, I'm going to let history decide. Yes, that's right. How do you feel about that today? Well, now that there is no more history, it's a bit problematic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the end of history kind of changed that. Yeah. As Mose Allison says, ever since the world ended, I don't get out as much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's a little troubling. Uh, but... You know what? In the end, you, it, you, there's nothing you can do about that. Because uh, what I think is, it, when I think about it today, like, okay, you, you want to let history decide. Absolutely. What that means is do not be swayed or motivated by whatever the definition of success is right now. You follow that light. That's what you say. You know, you stay the course. That's what you did. This is, I'm about history. And that's a long history. It's a long revolution. And I'm thinking of. about that. On the other hand. Yeah. Every moment is history. This is history. Well, and let's let's be practical here. Every moment uh, we make a, a number of decisions. Every little decision that we wind up making, every little what, what seems trivial. I mean, even to the point: Do I turn left or do I turn right to go to the store? Obviously, has some impact on what happens to you in the in the longer run. The, the history that's going to decide is made while you wait. Yeah. You are making the history. So, ultimately. The decisions themselves aren't so important. The decision maker and what motivates the decision maker, that's what's important because those little decisions come and go, but they all come from somewhere. So I guess when I'm saying we're going to let history decide, what I'm really saying is I'm going to decide by making me who I, I'm able to make me. Uh -huh. So in that sense, I am my own history. I'm part of history. I am going to determine what memory lives on more or less and we all are so we're responsible for it getting back to jazz jazz is a way to constantly keep taking your t your temperature who are you now who are you related to this who are you related to that how do you feel about this with jazz if you're true you can't escape feeling something you might not feel what you had hoped to feel or what people want you to feel but you will feel something well it reminds me of something that spike wilner said to me who owns smalls he said you know the thing about this music is you cannot hide in this music yeah. you cannot hide who you are or what you sound like when you play art blakey said what it is is you're up there in your birthday suit. <laughs> <laughs> You're up there in your birthday suit. Well, it's an appropriate time to be in your birthday suit, man. I'm in my birthday suit. 76 years old, man. You know, it's it honestly, I have to say, you know, you said jazz has been a way of uh, transportation for yes. me. I, it, it's been such a good break. I, I mean, I think of that way, my, you know, 76 years, a lot, of, a lot of stuff happened and a lot of stuff didn't happen. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff could have happened. And I've been very, very fortunate, you know, to have trusted in the kindness of strangers and followed the music. And so here I am in reasonably good health uh, with uh, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity at every turn to go forward, whatever that's going to mean. Uh, you know, I still have the choice literally at any point during the day to walk over to that piano and sit down and give it another shot. Yes. And likewise, you know, I can have this conversation with you 
and it's perfectly normal. There's nothing abnormal about this. We have, it's, we tell people, we, this is a part of our ongoing conversation we've had for 40 years. I think that's why it's so hard to step into it. You know, I, I realize yeah. that interviewing you is very challenging for me because yeah. there's no beginning or end to it. But also, I think hearing the way you respond to questions, and I don't know if this is the way you respond to them, when other people ask these kinds of questions of you, I have a feeling that you contain your thoughts a little more maybe with other people. Is But, but the, it's a real window into what's happening in your head. I mean, you don't stay in the lane often. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we talk about this. <laughs> me being a rule breaker, the yeah. rules don't apply to me. Listen, you got to be able to drive the road the way the road is. You know, it's one of the things they teach you if you're in a high-performance driving course. Is you have to drive the road. You can't drive the lane. Driving the lane actually is not as safe as driving the road, driving the contours of the road. And if a thought takes you somewhere or if life takes you somewhere, you have to drive the road. Yes. Well, I've been asking you about this lately because uh, there's this kind of like decision you made in your life that's woven into the mythology of you know, your career and my life. And that's that you chose to stay in Madison, Wisconsin. You, you, you chose to both have a career that was like a global career and it was a universal thing. And you talked to all these great players and you became one of them. And, and, you know, you really asserted yourself in the space and times in which you lived. And on the other hand, you did it with a home base in Madison, Wisconsin. And Mm -hmm. in its day, even today, it would be seen as a little bit of a statement, but in its day, it was like a radical thing to do, not to play by the sort of the typical rules which, which would dictate that normally you'd have to be on a coast and you'd have to kind of be set up in a certain it way. It was seen as insane, frankly. Insane. A lot of people told me, you're nuts. You can't do that. So part of the narrative has been, well, this is why you're not more famous. This is why you didn't have more commercial success. On the other hand, there's another way of looking at it, which says, well, no, as a matter of fact, everything that you did achieve is a byproduct of choosing to be set up here. Both are true. (laughs) Absolutely. Both are true. Uh, Living here encouraged me and forced me to invent myself. And living here was a kind of a slap in the face to the industry I was in, you know, and now, of course, it's a different world. But back then, I would leave a message for somebody and they'd say, area code 608, where is that? Well, now you can have an area code 608 cell phone and, mm-hmm. and be living in Manhattan. So, yeah, things have changed dramatically. And <laughs> I'm not as uh, comfortably isolated as I used to be. You know, I, I used to be really nicely tucked into my own little bed. And, mm-hmm. you know, I used to walk around Madison as if. I was padding around my yard. I never even thought, I didn't take carry a wallet, you know? I would go out there. I remember once I actually got pulled over for speeding and the cop came up to me and I didn't have my wallet with me, my license or anything. He looked at me, he said, Ben, slow down. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> well, no, and you used to say you could put Ben Sidron on an envelope, put a st- Madison, put a stamp on it and it would get to you. Of course. But that's an unusual position to be in. And on the one hand, you wanted to know what it was like to live that life, get paid like one of those cats, yeah. be one of them. And on the other hand, you you did get to have it both ways in a I certain did. way. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. I wanted to know. And on the other hand, uh-huh. I was smart enough not to get on that bus. Yeah. I stayed off the bus. You know, yeah. Phil Woods celebrates the bus, how all the education in the life yeah. was on the bus. But at the end of his life, Phil was very remorseful that he wasn't a better father. Mm. He talked about that. As a matter of fact, he really teared up. So I got to have it both ways. I got to be a good father and a good family man and a, a good guy and to mm-hmm. know what it felt like. And in the end, man, that's like a victory that you can't buy and that there's no syllabus for. I, the, the metaphor is leaving a trail of crumbs through the forest. Yes. You know, I, I'm always aware of the, of the trail that I'm leaving behind. Again, the assumption is history will decide, but that you have to allow for squirrels coming along and eating the and trail. And eating your crumbs. <laughs> absolutely. That's absolutely right. Your record got cut out of the bin. Man. I saw there's, no, there's no, you can't find My records had. used to get cut out so fast. Yeah. I actually joked that I made cutouts. And then I thought about <laughs> making cutouts. I thought, well, maybe that's a business. Yeah. And it turns out it was a business that record companies were taking successful records, overprinting them, dumping them because they didn't have to pay royalties to the artists once they cut them out. Mm. So uh, I wasn't wrong. You weren't wrong to do that. I wasn't wrong with making cutouts. Were there moments 
I mean, this is a big question and I, you know, but I'll see what comes into your head where you were, you know, you have this idea of facing your fears, right? That if you say something scares you and really scares you, it probably means you need to go towards it. Mm -hmm. What were the things that scared you that you had to go towards? Do you have memory of being scared to do something and doing it anyway? Yeah. Performing. I was not a natural performer. I liked playing music and I liked hanging out with musicians, but I did not know how to get up in front of an audience. I didn't know what that was about. And then God knows when I had to make a living doing it. There, there were frightening things. The most fright, single most frightening moment was when we did this thing at Carnegie Hall as a tribute to Eddie Jefferson and the Manhattan Transfer was on it and John Hendricks and all these singers and Dizzy and Moody and all these guys. And my thing, part of what I did is I went up with Tim Hauser of the Manhattan Transfer and sang the scat sing thing from the 40s called What's This? And it was me and Tim. And it was, you know, but boy, but boy, but boy, but boy, we're singing and I had memorized it and learned and everything. But I had never... And Tim's chops were up. I mean, that's what he did. That's he... what Tim did, man. He was a baddest yeah. bebopper on the planet in terms of doing that at the time. And here was me. And I had never sung not sitting behind a piano. And I had to stand up on stage at Carnegie Hall next to Tim and do that. I mean, was there not a part of you that said, how did I get myself into this? How did I become a guy who they think I can do this? I don't think I, I thought that far through it. I, <laughs> I thought, what in the world am I going to do? And, but here's the kicker. I was terrified. I went up. I was doing it. I was standing on stage at Carnegie Hall doing it. And my thought was, oh, this doesn't feel like anything. Wait a minute. It was the scariest thing ever to be at the top of the mountain and have it not feel scary. Hmm. It didn't feel scary. It didn't. No, it didn't feel one way or the other. It felt like Tuesday at eight o'clock. And or has something. that been your experience? That that's yes. what things feel like. Yes. When you Everything. talk, when you interviewed Miles, that was your experience. Yes, feels just like this. And that is what my history teacher told me fifty years ago. He said, "Ben, this is exactly what history feels like when you study history and you read about the French Revolution and you think that the people on the barricades and you know Les Mis and all this yeah. stuff there was this." It feels just like this. Mm -hmm. You are. This is what history feels like, and so deal with this. Yes, deal with this. This is it. This is your shot. And so, yeah, that was the scariest thing. Was it wasn't scary? The scariest thing was it wasn't scary. What moments come to mind where you think I achieved what I wanted to? When we made uh, "Don't Cry for No Hipster," huh? That made me so happy. That that's that it. I've never said this uh, yeah. specifically to you, but yeah. that really turned out so nicely. I liked uh, composing those songs the way I did. Yeah. I liked going in that room with you and the cats in Brooklyn. Yeah. I liked cutting it live, singing it live, playing the solos live, walking out of that room and thinking that's the way it's supposed to be. There are those projects that do come together where you think everything was right. The material was right. The players were right. The time was right. Yep. Yeah, it was easy. And you know what the funniest thing is? I agree. I think it's one of the best things we've worked on together. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's one of your best records. You know, I love some of the older stuff that yeah. predates me too. But the funniest thing is, I mean, it was such a push. The record, we believed in it so much. Not that it didn't do well, huh. but that we, 18 months later, we put out another thing that was kind of like, well, uh, no. here's this. And that's the one that they played on I, the radio. I know. I know. Well, that's the curse of Space Cowboy too, right. you know. Wait, tell me about the Curse of Space Cowboy, because I, I think about this with you. You know, you have achieved so much and so much that's meaningful to you. And everybody sort of has to make their deal with the universe, you know, and part of your deal is you, the I'm top associated. of your bio is always associating you with the Steve Miller band and Space Cowboy and a misunderstanding. Ultimately, let's call it what it is, a misunderstanding about what the Space Cowboy is. It's an early hit of Steve's that he mentions in a bigger hit. That he his. calls out in his big hit. Yeah. And right. people, so everybody knows the expression Space Cowboy, but nobody knows the song Space Cowboy, which is what Steve and I came up with together, or some people do. But I, no, I think a lot of times people assume you wrote the Joker. Oh, absolutely. They yeah. think you wrote the Joker because he says some people call me the, the Space, Space Cowboy. Cowboy. And why would you call that song the Joker? Right. Oh, I'm a joke. It, it looks like a dopey song anyway. With uh, Space Cowboy? Now my, I like your version of it that you cut later on in the 80s, but the original record with Steve is, as far as I can understand it, is Lady Madonna. It's a cop from Lady Madonna, which is a cop from a song called Bad Penny Blues, as Georgie Fame told me. Uh-huh. 
So it's a theft from a theft. But uh, no. And, I, and Steve came in with the Lady Madonna riff. He said, we yes. Do it. Yeah, we, we cut the track. And you needed lyrics. And he needed lyrics. And so uh, Glenn Johns, who was producing it, sent me and Steve back to the hotel to come up with some lyrics. And I said, since you copped Lady Madonna, yeah. let's cop something else. And there was a song oh. called Looking Through the Bla- a Glass Onion. You know, the walrus is Paul. I, I told said, you about the strawberry said, fields. Yeah, I told you about strawberry fields. So right. You so said, I told you about, about living in the USA. You know, right. So that's all. It was nothing. It, it was wasn't anything and it had the the term uh, space cowboy in it and s- subsequently well you told me that you wrote the verses and then steve turned i wrote to you, everything up except- to it says because i'm a space cowboy bet you weren't ready for that and that's exactly what came out of steve's mouth he turned to you and said because i'm a space because i'm a space cowboy bet you weren't ready for that now, i will say what's interesting about that and probably because he calls it back in the joker is the space cowboy has become a f- a Cultural oh, it's a frame. cultural meme. It's a meme. I saw a cartoon the other yeah. day of a guy in a spacesuit sitting on the moon with a cowboy hat yeah. on his head saying, I kind of miss being the gangster of love. I mean, space cowboy is everywhere. And it's been referenced not just by Jamiroquois, but it yeah. keeps getting referenced and referenced it and referenced. It does know they keep making it's movies a cultural and songs. Mo- and- yeah, movies. And the fact that I'm connected to that has been <laughs> such a bizarre thing. Yeah. I mean, who would have guessed? Who would have thought yeah. that that would turn into anything at all? Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's right. And not only that, but if you do a Google search on me, Google thinks that I not only did I write The Joker, but I wrote Fly Like an Eagle and I wrote everything. I mean, it's just bizarre. And once it's out there, you can't change it. It's very interesting. You know, we, we were playing this gig in Colorado later this year and uh, they sent me the uh, press material on the gig and yeah. I had to write red lines through all this stuff that you supposedly did and what's dark about that in a funny way is that it sort of implies that if you didn't do that that you know uh they wouldn't hire me on the gig kind of yeah yeah Uh, yeah i i don't feel that but i do feel that what it does suggest is that in the world of hype the, the actual work is not important Right. And so it has to be important to you it's you can't wait for the world to tell you right that what you did was that this was the best work and this wasn't i mean don't cry for no hipster did pretty well for me but i think everybody likes it who anybody who likes ben sidron music likes that record right and so that was successful i mean your your question was uh, i guess something what am i proud of what am i most proud of the work itself the work as a body ha- has been meaningful above and beyond anything we're talking about mm-hmm. right now jazz any of it for the simple reason as you know, that my father died and left nothing behind. He left literally an empty wallet and a stopped watch. It's so poetic, I can't believe it, but that's exactly what he left behind. And, you know, uh, he died when I was really young and I never really got to know him. So subsequently, I became insanely motivated to leave work behind. Yes. And to do good work and to leave good work behind. And uh, today, I'm 76 years old. And I've left a really nice pile of work behind. I'm really happy. You have no doubt who I am. And my granddaughter is going to have no doubt who I am. And that's pretty much all you can ask for. Yeah, I think so, too. What's really interesting, as I think about it today, is I know it it was a big deal for you when you turned one year older than your father was. Yeah. When he died. Yeah, he died at 52. And when I turned 53, it was really something. But so what's really deep about that, when I think about it, is that you maintain that the work that you're the most proud of is actually the work that you have done in those intervening 20-some years. Yes, thank goodness. That's absolutely right. I think about that a lot. Uh, My work didn't really uh, take off until I was almost 60. And it's funny because I used to think that when I when I was a six year old kid looking out of these eyes or a 10 year old kid thinking, I just got to wait till I can get out of here. I've always had this sense that I was going to do my better work when I was older. Mm. Well, you've said, uh, you know, one of the things you like about jazz is that it rewards you for getting older. You become more of who you are. You become distilled yeah. into this thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also notable that the work that you're most proud of, the best work that you say, I didn't really get going until I was 60. Yeah. That's not the stuff that they lead with in the bio. Yeah. You know, know. it's actually once you achieved a certain amount of credibility and you didn't have to worry about that. 
that yeah. you were able to start. Do, okay, are you taking me seriously? Okay, now let me check out this thing that you didn't even. Well, but also know about. included. Also included in the last twenty years is the book. There was a fire, which took seven years to write. And as you know, when my back was bad, I wrote it on my knees. You yeah. know, I mean, and it turned out great. I mean, that's part of the work, man. I love that. I love being able to have done that. I love to have survived that. That's my PhD. There was a fire as my PhD. That took a lifetime mm -hmm. to, to figure out how to do that. And to figure out how to write it my way, you know, <sighs> education is a personal thing and everybody has to go get their own. And you have to believe in yourself enough to know that your way is as good as any other way. Mm -hmm. And that takes forever ever for somebody to get to really own and to be comfortable with. And so it took a long time for me to say, no, this is how I write and this is how I think. And mm -hmm. this book reflects my thinking, not the way you might think, not the way uh, an academic might think or somebody in mm -hmm. Jewish studies would say it's part of the canon. No, this is how I think and this is how I'm going to write it. And that's what a lifetime does for you. Mm -hmm. You get to the point where you go, no, that's me, man. Yeah. That's well, that's I the do. and that's the jazz message. That's the jazz. That's message. the jazz message. That's who I am. That's what I'm going to do. Ben Sidron. Ah, we did it. Thank you for the jazz message. Seventy six years old. Trombones. Yesterday. <laughs> Seventy six <laughs> trombones. That's you know every number has a magic association. Yeah. This is the trombone birthday. The next year, two birthdays. Two birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we have to tell the joke? No, I, you leave uh, it. You just okay. leave it out there. Okay. All right, tell the joke. Go ahead, tell the joke. A uh, guy, a uh, trombone player, gets a, a recording date. It's the first date he's had in a long time. He throws his uh, trombone in the back of the car. He drives to the recording studio, goes inside to make sure it's the right place. He goes in. The engineer says, oh, well, you didn't leave your horn in the car, did you? He said, yeah, I did. Why? The engineer says, well, it's a very dangerous neighborhood. And the guy goes outside, and sure enough, it is a dangerous neighborhood. What does he find? Two trombones. Two trombones. You know, I heard in Nashville they tell it with banjos. There he was, my friends, Ben Sidron, my dad. I'll be back again soon with another great conversation. Until then, from the closet, in my bedroom, from where I grew up, I'll talk to you soon.